The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Welcome to a Tuesdays here at Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and you will get our starting five shout-outs going here. A deeper look into the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers. Also a partnership, possibly. Some reports on the Big Ten and the SEC. Maybe going to Nashville next week for more than just uh, country music slash Broad, Broadway. So uh, we'll get into that. Uh, numbers to get in, 489-1240, 489-1240, 800 to dial up. Can join us here along the Hale Varsity Radio Network. As always, check us out on the stream. Like and subscribe, Hale Varsity YouTube, Hale Varsity Radio Twitter, at HVarsity Radio can find each of us on social media at Herbal Essence for Elijah at Schmidt underscore radio for me, Chris Schmidt, and can email Chris at HaleVarsity.com. What's going on with uh, the celebrity passages? I mean, just kind of pop into my mind. A couple of great sports figures yesterday with Pete Rose and Dikembe Mutombo. Uh, John Amos passed it away. Today, uh, you have uh, all sorts of craziness going on. At least there's a little bit of sports to dive into. We'll hear from Tony White. That's coming up. Uh, Dylan Raiola also spoke today, and uh, we'll get into it. Elijah, what's shaking? Are you back in bowling tonight? Is that the, the plan? That is the plan, yeah. My brother has a, uh, an essay to write for his uh, graduate school. So he's unsure if he's going to get that done or not. So uh, it does appear as if I'm going to be in on Bowling League. Looking forward to that. Uh, I was told the team didn't have a great week last week, but we're ready to lock back in tonight and climb our way back up the leaderboard. So I'm looking forward to that. I am slightly concerned, Schmitty. Um, I laid it out this morning. Well, let's lay out our morning here really fast, hmm? uh, Schmitty. Is, uh, we went down to the uh, the College of Journalism and let some of the kids know about the horrors of a career students. in talk radio. Uh, so students, sure, yeah. And... I show up to the station this morning where we meet up because we're riding down together, and some of us on the stream will see this. We're wearing pretty much the same outfit today, and we got to stop doing this. Listen, a little different. Because for, you've, for got, you've got logo logoing, I do not. I have a pocket. See, uh, but what are we wear? What are we wearing? It's a gray quarter zip. Mm. It's quarter zip Tuesday because with, it's seventy degrees here. With navyish pants, I know your, yours are a different material than mine, but navy pants. Yeah, I'm wearing jeans. Yeah, and I'm wearing golf pants. Mm. So, but they still are the same color. And from a distance, it looks like we're in the exact same thing. So I'm pulling into the it's parking lot. One of us is tall and has a mustache, sure. and the other one's a fire hydrant. But you're you're standing behind your car when I pull up into into the station here this morning, <laughs> and I look at you and I go. I don't think I have time to go home and change. The only time it's okay to twin is is for a football game. Fair? Yeah, yeah, with the company apparel. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. sure. So uh, off we go, right? Uh, memorable Monday night? No, not so much. We have uh, a comment in here saying father-son combo. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> that is disrespectful more, to more my dad. Like, more like twins. The tall guy, the young, gu- good-looking guy, and then I'm, I'm Danny DeVito. Yeah, that, is both di- always. that is both disrespectful to my father and disrespectful to your son. <laughs> to call me your son and you my dad. That's <laughs> well, a double whammy of it's disrespect. Horrible. <laughs> it's brutal. It's bad news. But I'm saying from a twins standpoint, classic 1990s movie. You've got uh, the the good twin and Arnold, and the the, the bad uh, goofball and and Danny DeVito. Uh, Dan chimes in with the Mary Kate uh, Olsen and what's the other one? Ashley from uh, Full House. Yeah, we're we're twins. Thank you for that. Dan can always tweet at the show at uh, HMR City Radio. So we'll we'll get into some some football here. Dive into uh, the the scare factor and. When we talk fear, listen, this thing's a seven-point ball game, and there's a lot of things that you can 
think about and imagine as a Nebraska fan that, that might wear you out about Saturday? What is the team going to be like defensively? What are they going to be like from a tackling standpoint? Will Rutgers be problematic in the red zone with their run defense? How's Nebraska going to be uh, when it comes to stopping, you know, Manungai uh, at, at, at running back? The guy's averaging 6.1 a carry. I mean, he could go for 2,000 yards. Don't know that the schedule is going to allow for that, but he's damn good. He's a... He's a he's a throwback running back for Rutgers. He's he's incredible. Well, I'd, I'd call him a top two running back in college football right now. Sure. You have Genty from Boise State mm-hmm. and then Monongai from Rutgers. Those are the two in college football that I think are head and shoulders above the rest of the field. I think well, that's what type of running back Nebraska has come into Lincoln. Well, and, and that's what that's what Chiano does. He gets a running back and he feeds him the football twenty five times on average, and they just murder you they just go downhill they body blow you but you know i time will tell if Manungai's in that class of of great backs maybe you've seen come through lincoln so for a lot of years you saw that in your own backfield as a nebraska football fan you saw the calvin joneses the Derek browns the wee backs you saw lawrence of course uh, and Amon Green uh, with an incredible stable from 93 through 97. Uh, you, you've seen uh, some of the, the, the past greats, the Mike Rogiers, the Roger Craigs were in the same backfield. Doug DeBose was tremendous. Keith Jones, Enzone Jones was, was big time. Oh. Kent, Kent Clark, can't forget old Kenny Clark. And then you've seen opposing backs come in and maybe ruin your Saturday. Going way, way back, James Wilder from Missouri. Oklahoma State's Barry Sanders. Not Thurman, but Barry. Uh, Eric B. Enemy, certainly one that, that ruined it. My, and uh, My era thinks of Ricky Williams, Le- Ricky Le- Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell was big time with those Sparty teams. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, the Ricky Williams game, though. I mean, his, his, uh, his night against Nebraska in 98 won him the Heisman. I mean, he just pounded away. They won a tight ball game, 20 to 16. Uh, why? Because they hit a field goal. Texas always hit field goals here. And that's where I want to go. I want to start talking special teams. And it is going to be imperative that there's a fix Saturday. You don't give them too many opportunities to kick. You got to get seven and not three in this tight of a ball game. That'll be your difference. Is, red, is, is Rutgers red zone defense uh, number two in the country? You're kicking three instead of getting seven. If, if you're even getting three. If you're getting three, right. But that, that'll be it for Nebraska. That, that will be whether they win or they lose. And Coach McBride nailed it yesterday with the reality of, of discipline. How many stupid penalties do you have that ruin a, a drive? Because if you're Nebraska, you've been able to move it between the 20s fairly well. And you've been able to pick up some recycled yards fairly well when there's been a penalty. But what's your payoff? What's your, what's your third down and what's your red zone look like? And it's going to be even more critical this Saturday against Rutgers because of, of just what they're great at. They're great at running the football. And they're not going to really blink. I, I imagine Memorial Stadium will be amped up. Going to be a good ball game, 3 o'clock kick. That being said, this is the third leg. Right? They've been in a tight ball game against Washington where they survived. Washington left about 14 to 17 points on the field, but Rutgers forced threes, and those went wide right three times, to be exact, for Washington. They, they stormed out of the gate, a tough environment at, in, in uh, Virginia Tech, Blattsburg. I know the Hokies have been down, but it's still a place you don't want to pick and go to on purpose very often uh, to Lane Stadium. And they drilled them early and hung on late, including a safety early in the ball game, to to really capture momentum and then just kind of ground and exhaust the clock, twenty six to twenty three. So this is the third straight one possession ball game Rutgers is planning on being in. Nebraska was in a tight ball game at halftime a week ago against a a team that that may not win another football game. Not Nebraska's fault, but at least they've got a little bit of confidence going in. When, when they were able to come out, take control, and then distance themselves, they'll be able to uh, have home cooking, which you, you think is better than the alternative if you're Nebraska. But it's going to come down to some guys making plays. And, 
you know, what type of yak yards does uh, Manungai get after he's initially met? Uh, just, I'm, I'm wondering how, how Nebraska's feeling going in. They, they got one more little hurdle to a little bit of a ice bath break because bye week's looming. Well, let me ask you the question, Schmidt. As you preview this Rutgers team here on a Tuesday, do you worry more about the the Rutgers defense or the Rutgers offense? Particularly the, the two things that I look at that are going to be major keys, A, the Rutgers rushing attack, and B, the Rutgers' ability defensively to bend but not break. Because that's the two things. That, that's how they've gotten here so far. I, they I, have a bend but don't break defense that forces three, F that. And then they have a, a rushing attack that keeps them in rhythm all game long because they know – I don't want to say with certainty, but they have a, a pretty good feeling that if they run the ball twice on first down and second down, they're going to set themselves up with third and manageable. That's that's how this Rutgers team has made their money all year long. I worry about both. If I've got to go look at the scales, which way is the scale tipping? I'm, I'm more worried about the run game. Yep. I'm more worried about the run game. I think Nebraska will be able to maybe score some points and hit a big play or two, even though Shiano typically doesn't do it. They, they've given up some points. Uh, not a ton, but enough. And and you should be able to get to that 20 to 27 number if you're Nebraska, if you're going to win the ball game. Again, the rule of thumb for the Big Ten is first team to 30, yep. if you can get there. In a defensive slugfest where you got to bring a hard hat and a, and a lunch pail, first team to 24 for me is is when I look at these type of ball games where it's a phone booth setup. So I worry about Nebraska's run defense based on what I've seen. Now, they, they buttoned up and tightened up against uh, Purdue. Great. But the previous week wasn't a good day for them. And it, it showed when they lost to Illinois, right? And Callie McManus is a guy that is 2-0 against Nebraska. He's mobile enough. He's not going to go win it himself, but he's dangerous enough throwing it, and he's mobile enough. So while he's not a great quarterback, he's not as good as Illinois' quarterback, it, it – can potentially keep you off balance. So I worry about the run game for Rutgers. And then close second is is the offense. And, and I think Cliff says it well here. He says if Nebraska shuts down the run, they win. And that's, totally. that's about how I feel. It's, it's not, if Nebraska is super efficient in the red zone, they get touchdowns, I can still see a way where they lose this football game if they can't slow down the run. If they stop the run and put the game on Cali Kamanis' shoulders and say, hey, go beat Nebraska – what are you going to do? Mm. I don't think there's a, a route to victory for Rutgers. So I, I think he's got it. The, the, the question, it's a big if, if they shut down the run, because that is a, a very, very good rushing attack. It's not 2023 Michigan. It's not 2022 Michigan. It's not 2024 Michigan with just the, hey, we're going to run the football here. We're going to tell you where we're going to run it, and we dare you to stop it. It's not that, but it is a, a very buttoned-up rushing attack that is, in my opinion, the best Nebraska's seen so far this season, which is concerning because there's been lesser rushing attacks whenever I look at both Illinois and Northern Iowa that have had success against this Husker defense. So it's a pride game for me. Like Those two teams, mm-hmm. your defense was exposed a little bit by their rushing attacks. It's a pride game for me now with the, the best running back you've seen so far, a very, very salty offensive line. How are you going to be able to, to go in there and, and – Maybe not shut it down, but slow down that Rutgers rushing attack. Yep, slow it down, tackle well, all those good things that you're waiting to see Nebraska stack in back-to-back ball games. Cliff is in. We'll get the shout-outs here. KG checks in. It'll be the opposite of the Colorado game. You dare Colorado to run. Now you're going to dare Rutgers to throw it. Fair enough. Uh, good point, KG. Uh, take away what their uh, strong – hand or their preference is cliff in first all the way down in florida uncle larry is in uh says thanks for the shout out uh for his sister yesterday no worries uncle larry appreciate you tuning in arlo is here tiger shark diver checks in i joined a gang it's called the almighty (laughs) cornheads so uh what was the initiation tiger shark diver what what uh, what type of initiation was it uh, financial, or was it more of a blood in blood out? Eat beef is here. He checked in. Tuesdays are better than Mondays. Yet we're closer to the weekend. Real Matthew is here. Anonymous checks in. Uh, says Rutgers is a slight favorite in six of their eight games left. With the the Big Ten, will the Big Ten really want them to have a chance at an eleven and one season? Maybe make the title game. I expect honest officiating on Saturday. <laughs> That's funny. That's so good. Because, uh, yeah, what kind of a ref show are you going to get Saturday 
at home if you're Nebraska or on the road if you're Rutgers. Or maybe on the flip side, the Big Ten wants that New York market in the Big Ten championship game. Sure, right? That's why you went and got them, of course. Uh, it didn't hurt that old uh, Jim Delaney was a uh, Rutgers grad, I believe. I wouldn't know. I think Jimbo was either a graduate of North Carolina as a graduate. Maybe he got his law degree from Carolina and went to Rutgers undergrad. I may have my history mixed up, but I think there's some sort of Rutgers tie for, for old Jim Delaney. Yeah, well, look at us just pushing referee conspiracy theories here. On a Tuesday. James Williams checked in and says NU is 6-0 and against the boys in Jersey. Like it. Mr. Erickson in, checking in from South Dakota. Grateful Red is here. And says, hoping we can figure some things out uh, and put uh, four quarters of football together. Uh, amen. Uh, and uh, you have Jack here. Uh, uh, Luce is also checked in. Jeff is here. Colin is here. Good to have you, Colin. And uh, we'll get some more comments. The other Dave checks in. Jim is here. Uh, starting to think that eight and four may be in jeopardy. Yeah, that's fair. Right, the more people I bump into, it's scaled back, it's dialed back from nine to maybe eight to, to maybe seven is the number. This is your watershed moment because Indiana likely going to be unbeaten. We'll check in with Mitch Sherman next on Hale Varsity Radio. It's that time. Hey, Mitch. Mitchy, 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 Mitchy. We're looking for you, pal. Mitch Sherman from The Athletic, talking Big Red. Unleash the fury, Mitch. Unleash the fury! On Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Logger, Chris Carlin, voice of Rutgers football, and host of Carlin versus Joe ESPN coming up next hour. Mitch, are you going to be able to... Hang on with us, bud, or will you release some fury here? We're catching you in the middle of a Royals playoff game, big dog, and thanks for, for multitasking. Oh, no worries. It's only been 10 years or nine years, so, you know, I'm here for you. Uh, I'm okay right now because the Royals just took the lead on Bobby Witt Jr.'s first playoff RBI. Well, that's not shocking. Bobby Witt's done it all, man. He's been incredible this year. That's right. If somebody's going to come through in this situation, it's Bobby. So, but if if Vinny Pasquantino goes deep while I'm talking to you here, uh, I'm, I'll mute the phone for a few seconds. Well, as long as you don't, you know, swear, you can just go nuts, as, uh, right. as Mr. Buck would say. Mitch, let me ask the question to you. Uh, among all the Royals you have ever watched, I'm not asking you to say you're wearing a jersey right now, but if there was an all-time Royal, you could have their jersey on right now in this moment. Which Royal are you picking? It's not. There's not even a question it's george brett george brett okay because our, our friend will he was over in the newsroom whenever i came in here this afternoon he was wearing his bo jackson jersey. his baby blue bo jackson yeah, it was pretty beauty. pretty cool you know that's cool but i grew up with george brett so no, there's george, not there's not even a it's there it's not, there's not even a thought in my mind no there's there's george there's bo it's a big sightser guy of course recently alex was phenomenal so uh, yeah, so Mitch is it's it's playoff Mitch. I like it as as he's good to go. So let's talk Nebraska Rutgers here, Mitch. And uh, you know, pretty stern's the word I'll use. Stern for Nebraska as uh, they are ready to try and accept a, a challenge on the ground here this Saturday versus Rutgers. The the Nebraska defense. Do you feel like they feel? have something to prove uh, when it comes to being a, a stout and sturdy run defense? A little bit more so before they went into the game last week. And it's not like Purdue is the kind of challenge that Nebraska is going to face against Rutgers. The challenges are now getting these four games starting with Purdue are getting greater every week for four games. And, and there's a bye week in there, mm-hmm. but you know what I mean? So Purdue to Rutgers to Indiana to Ohio State, Indiana on the road, and of course Ohio State just being Ohio State. So we're in week two of that of that escal- escalation, and I, I I think the defense did its job, very much did its job on Saturday in in West Lafayette, and it was a, it was um, more of a challenge. 
for a couple reasons. One, it's the first time away from home, and I think defense feeds off emotion and energy more than offense. So playing on the road is a time where you know, you've got to create your own energy and bring the juice, and they didn't have issues with that. And then, two, Nebraska's offense was just so off track when it got inside the 40-yard line or into the red zone and had so many issues, whether it was penalties or miscues on special teams, that it put the defense in a difficult spot, and they answered the challenge every time and really answered the challenge throughout the entire game. There was the field goal uh, march that Purdue had to start the second half, and that's just about the only blip on the on – the, um, you know, that the defense had in in this last game. So I think they're feeling pretty good about themselves and then can go into this game against Rutgers where you know what the task is going to be. It's going to be to shut down that running game and, and, and be physical and tough against a, against an offense that, that wants to do the same thing. It's Mitch Sherman with us here from the Athletic Hale Varsity Radio talking at Nebraska Rutgers. And Mitch, I asked this question to Schmitty in the first segment. I want to reset it to you asking like the two things that Rutgers is really known for so far this year, where they've made their money. Defensively, it's bowing up in the red zone, one of the top teams in the country at keeping you out of the end zone, forcing you to three. And then offensively for Rutgers, it's that, that strong rushing attack, one of the best running backs in the country. Which of those two things scares you more from the outside looking in as you preview this football game? Probably the Rutgers red zone defense. You have a freshman quarterback, and more so, more than that, I don't, and we can probably stop calling Dylan a freshman. He's he's just a good quarterback, uh, not doing not doing a whole lot of freshman things. Yeah, but you have an inexperienced quarterback still. He hasn't seen everything that's that's going to get thrown at him in a in a season. But the bigger issue, you, you want to get points when you get down in that area. And sometimes in the Big Ten, you've got to settle for three. And Nebraska doesn't feel good. It's hard to feel good right now. About, it, about the chances for Nebraska to, to score if it's not a touchdown when, when they get into that, into that area of the field because the kicking mechanism just, just is not working. Not all on the kicker. I think two of the three misses that John Hole had last week were more attributed to the snapping, but they all go together and they all have to work, the kicking, the, the, the holding, and the snapping in order to get those three points, and that just hasn't been something that Nebraska has been able to accomplish with any consistency at all this season in the last few weeks since Tristan Albano went back on the shelf, it's been, you know, just, just uh, not there. So I'm more concerned about that if I'm Nebraska than I am about to, to the ability to stop um, Manungai, Kyle Manungai, the, the, um, the great Rutgers running back. I think, I think the Nebraska defense is in a position to, uh, to put up a fight and, to, and, you know, they're not playing with one hand tied behind their back, much like I think the offense is because of the, the special teams issues. Mitch Sherman with us at Mitch Sherman on Twitter, the Locked On Nebraska pod. Catch that uh, daily from Mitch and uh, read him with The Athletic. Uh, fair point. I picked the rushing attack. I, I just, I'm just i interested to see Nebraska kind of be last year's Nebraska against the run when it comes to the leaky yards. And can they, uh, can they shut down and make Rutgers one-dimensional against a quarterback that is 2-0 and against him, but kind of the same formula, strong run game, and hit a pass here and there. Third downs, uh, Purdue did convert some third downs, but there was not really a threat after that uh, 7-3 to lead. Nebraska was able to answer with. Mitch, I want to go to, to Dylan Raiola and just – your impressions you've seen a lot of quarterbacks you've seen a lot of college football and just spend a second on the, the level he's playing at not only the throws he's making but the command standpoint just is this greater than you expected what what he's been able to do through these few games yeah everything's together it is because he's not deficient in any area like he you know the throws look good. He's on schedule. He's going through his progressions. He's figuring out the difference between zone and man and what to do. He's not getting confused. And there will be greater challenges down the road in the second half of the season. There'll be some times where uh, he's going to have to work really hard. Any any quarterback would. You could be a fifth year senior and you're still going to at times have moments where the defense wins the battle. But Dylan's winning so many of those battles right now that it's it's just kind of uh, it's yeah it's more than than what i expected five games in into his freshman year his composure um the 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 way that he's walked the line 
as a young player with so many older players around him to be able to find a way to be a leader and do it the right way where it, 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 it feels right within the team, I, I think is, is pretty remarkable. So everything that he's doing so far has been uh, above, uh, I think, what the level of expectation is. His throws are, you know, even when he's not making perfect throws, when he's not leading his receivers um, exactly the way that I, I think it's drawn up, you know, he's doing the right thing that where, he's, where he's getting pass interference penalties. It's not just uh, luck of the draw that Nebraska has. has uh, it's, it's, up, it's up around 15, I think. They had six on on Saturday at Purdue. Um, I believe I heard that number 15. It might, it might have been before. The, I think that was after the, the, the Purdue game. Anyway, it's a, it's a high number of pass interference calls that, that he's getting. And he, and he gets credit for that, too, because he's putting the ball in a position where the defense has no choice but to commit a penalty. It's Mitch Sherman with us here. And, Mitch, I want to get your thoughts here going back to Saturday. There was a moment in that game that's been making the rounds on Twitter where uh, pre-game the Purdue student section chanting, you're not Patrick, and then following Ja'Cory Barney's touchdown, which essentially put the game out of reach. He, uh, he what should I say, antagonized the Purdue student section, gave him some wah-wahs with the, uh, the old hand in front of the face, and then he put him to bed as well. Mm-hmm. Your reaction to that, did you like that? Yeah, I didn't see it happen in person, but I've seen it, on, I've seen it make the rounds on social media. It gave me a little Steph Curry um, night-night mm-hmm. uh, gesture. Yeah, I mean, you can do that kind of stuff if you can put your, if, if you can put your, uh, you know, your play, if your play backs it up. Now, if you're, uh, if you're a one in four quarterback who's completing 44% of your passes and you go out and do that, you know, you got, you got some explaining to do in the meeting room with your coaches, but his, his completion rates up over 70%. He's got what? Nine, nine, uh, touchdowns, two interceptions. He's thrown for 1200 yards more than any freshman in the country. I, I'd say that, I'd say that it's, he's, he's, uh, he can have a little swag. He can have some 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 confidence, some cockiness, even like that he showed in that moment about him. If he'd like, this is the kind of stuff that I think is good for Nebraska. That Nebraska needs. I mean, you don't want to be unsportsmanlike, and you don't want to uh, you don't want to put your team in a bad position. Uh, I don't think he's doing that. I, I, I think he's he's that's one way that he's able to lead this team. You know, you hear a lot of talk from older players on this team. And I think from Matt Rule about how. We are a good team, Nebraska. This this is a good team. Like it's almost like they, they're they're trying to convince each other, trying to convince themselves. Guys like Dylan Raiola and Jacory Barney, they don't need to hear that. Nobody needs to tell them they're good. They know they're good, and you know that's why uh, the future is bright with with these guys, and and um, and certainly for for Nebraska, un, uh, as long as uh, you know they're as long as Dylan is uh, is running the offense. Yeah, my, my thought on that was antagonizing the student section. I guess the apple really doesn't fall too far from the tree, huh? It totally seems like something Dom would do. Oh, Dom was much worse than that. <laughs> Dom, Dom, <laughs> yeah. Dom was, Dom, was not, Dom was not subtle in the gestures that he may have directed towards student sections on the road in, in, in Big 12 play. I, I think he makes Dylan look like a choir boy with what he did on Saturday. Some of us saw it firsthand down in Austin. We'll just leave that one be. <laughs> So, Mitch, best to, to you, best to your Royals as they uh, Thank you. push towards a, a date with uh, Carson Schmidt's Yankees, past Baltimore, of course. And uh, so. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make it happen. Mitch, we'll see you on, uh, on Saturday. Thanks for the time, bud. All right, thanks a lot. There he is, Mitch Sherman, back to the couch and playoff Mitch. Appreciate Mitch giving us a few minutes. Uh, and uh, so Brian checks in. Instead of twins or father-son, when it comes to us twinning today for the opportunity to speak to uh, the University of Nebraska broadcasting class that Professor Dolman was running, we loved our time there, a stepbrothers uh, remake. Who's Dale and who's Brennan? Who's Nighthawk? (laughs) Who's Dragon? (laughs) 489-1240, open phones till 5. Hail Varsity continues, powered by Cornhead Lager. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. So, full disclosure: during the break, I'm getting caught up on Coach Brendan Clinton's film session, sitting in the Georgia meeting room. Thought it was pretty funny when he did the, the Nebraska Colorado game, and I kind of look forward to these each week. Unfortunately, we can't air them. 
489-1240. Let's go to Clinton. Uh, Colton, excuse me. Colton, thanks for checking in. Welcome to Hale Varsity. Go for it. Hey, I was just watching the uh, Illinois-Penn State game over the weekend, and I was really impressed with Penn State's offensive line. They were able to kind of really take it to Illinois when they needed to and blow them off the ball. For Nebraska to get a Big Ten offensive line like that, I don't know if we're going to be able to get the top-end recruits like that, but we've gotten Spencer Long and Cam Jurgensen in as tight ends and converted them into offensive linemen. Is that a formula Nebraska needs to – maybe do to make a Big Ten offensive line. Colton, I think Nebraska is on the correct track. I think a lot of the freshmen you're going to see came in as linemen and will be developed. I'm thinking of the sledges of the world, checks of the world. Thanks for, for calling in, uh, Colton, on that. But I don't – Listen, if you see somebody at a spot, Spencer Long was a defensive lineman, they moved to offensive guard. Yeah, absolutely. Nebraska's not wrong with some of the moves they made, with with Bullock going from safety to linebacker. They've switched positions on guys before. Uh, If they deem it something that they want to work on, go for it. But right now they've done pretty well in recruiting and you're just seeing some, some of the development. You're seeing some of the development right away with uh, Gunnar Gatula, right? He's been in the program for a spring and then a summer, and previous be, into being forced into duty, had nine snaps, and he's held his own, and he's done pretty well. So I think uh, that's a situation where it just depends on the player. You don't have to go out of your way to, uh, to, to manufacture uh, a spot where you take Jurgens and you move him to center, like uh, Nebraska did under a previous staff, worked out well. Brilliant decision, and it's, p- it's paid off well in uh, in the NFL for for Cam, for sure. Four eight nine twelve forty, and uh, yeah, I don't I don't know that you have to go out of your way to do it, but just keep an eye out. I think Matt Rule and his staff have pretty inquisitive eyes to see if someone needs to flip spots, move positions. And uh, they'll do a good job. They'll do a really good job of getting guys drilled up. And that was talked about today at the media session with just how Nebraska's practice and scout work get guys ready for Saturdays. Who's with us? We go to Brian. Brian, thanks for hanging on. Welcome into Hale Varsity. Go for it. Hey, Schmidt. How are you doing today? Good, brother. What do you know? No, not much. Just trying to enjoy the nice day, I guess. Hey, I got a couple things, and they're kind of choppy here, but why – is it just my perception, or why does Rule try to head off the question about special teams like he doesn't want to – what am I trying to say? Address it? Doesn't want to talk about it? Um, well, Does he know it's just – it's too far – I mean, it's just we're too far into the season where it's just not going to get fixed. I I just don't see how it's going to get fixed. I think they're going to keep trying to fix it, and I don't believe they're ignoring the air quote problem. But when push comes to shove, can what you got on hand right now do it? Can you get a snap down? Can you put get a snap back? Can you get a snap down? Can you make a kick? And who knows how practice is going during the week? You know it's being drilled, but are the results getting any better? I don't have that answer. I have not broke out the camouflage to check it out, but it's it's got to be a concern because you can even be really good on the practice field. Does it translate to Saturday? And right now, he knows that you're in three to seven point ball games for much of this season. How are you going to be able to, to survive in advance uh, beyond? And it, it, it's got to make him sick. And, and like, to get back to your question originally, like, what, are you, right. what are you supposed yeah. to say up in front of the media? I just, yeah. I, mean, I just kind of – I mean, I just figure, I mean, if it's not done – if it's not fixed by now, it's probably not going to get fixed. And that's, I guess that, that's kind of my and thought. I, I think, is, my thought is, like, if it's bad, we all know it's bad. Like from watching the football games, we all know the field goal kicking situation very not, is very bad. much not trustworthy. 
So what are you going to get up in front of the media and say, like, man, yeah, it's bad. We know it. Okay, everyone in the state of Nebraska knows the kicking's bad. And you're not going to write checks that you can't go out and cash later, so you're not going to go promise it's going to be great. What, what, I guess what can you say? I think you accentuate the positive, as in you talk about other parts of your football team. Yep. And that's, that's how you focus. Right. And then another thing that concerns me is we, we're playing this game. The narrative has been, well, if we fix it, and then the narrative is like, well, if we can stop their run – well, <laughs> Dustin gives me very – I'm not very optimistic we're going to be able to because we couldn't against Northern Iowa. I mean, no, I don't I, know. Hopefully I'm – Well, the run, the run part of things – and, Brian, thanks for calling, brother. Appreciate you checking in. Listen, uh, it, it's, it's an attitude and a one-two thing with, with run stoppage, but you also got to get help from your offense. And from a substitution standpoint, you, you got to have guys come in and not have a ton of drop off up the middle uh, if that's where you're attacked or the edges. And I love what, what Jamari Butler said uh, today in, in his time in front of the media about, and I'm paraphrasing here, I don't have the specific quote, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a prove it game for him, right? Because he didn't have a, a, a game he felt was. As, as good as it needed to be against Illinois. What, what I've called it with you, Schmitty, off the record, not just for the defense, but for the entire team, is this, this is your redemption opportunity. That's what this, this week is for you because you kind of got your butt kicked in the trenches by Northern Iowa with what they wanted to do in the rushing attack. And, yeah, you, you ended up with a comfortable win. But then Illinois did what they wanted Illinois to do on did, first down. Exactly. What was last week, it was the get-right game against Purdue where you – we, we all know Purdue's offense is nothing special, but you did what you are supposed to do. You got back on track. This is the redemption game for you. It's another chance for a team to come to Lincoln that wants to probably execute a similar game plan to Illinois, control the clock, control the ball, don't put too much on your quarterback's shoulders and allow him to be efficient. It's the same kind of test. This is your redemption opportunity to show, you know what, what we were against Illinois is not who we were. That was an off night for us, and whenever we're on, that's not going to be an issue. That's what this game is. That's what this week is. It's your road to redemption. Well, you've had a chance to get punched by Northern Iowa, lose a tight one to Illinois. You knew Purdue was going to try and run it on you. They they didn't. And it's it's ramping up like Mitch talked about. And, and the ability to run and want to run continues to, to ramp up. Subtle jab here by Tiger Shark Diver. Uh, Elijah looks like the substitute teacher in Boogie Nights. Is that a jab? I could... could... I, I just, uh, of all the parts of Boogie Nights, the memory of the substitute teacher just doesn't uh, come to mind. Tuck is in. Good to have you, Tuck. Justin is here uh, as well in the stream. Like and subscribe, Hail Varsity YouTube. Jim says, think we'll be fine on the run game as long as we can. G? Read? What's he trying to say? I don't know where this comment even is. All right. Oh, as long as we could. Did he finish it anywhere? No, no. I don't think he did. All right, so I think his thoughts trailed off. <laughs> Arlo <laughs> says by ref show, Chris means bleep show. He just can't say it on air. We'll wind down. Our one, it's Hail Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. Hail Varsity Radio is live. Now, back to Schmitty. Schmitty's a great guy, but he don't have a brain. And Elijah. You want me to speak? When I point you, yeah. On Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you, winding down this first hour. It's Hail Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. More of your comments in the stream. Reminder, plenty of road shows this week to come find us with Hail Varsity Thursday out at the Single Barrel, 9th and P, downtown Lincoln. Get your football weekend kicked off the right way. Uh, so we'll be there 4 to 6 Friday on the road. We're at Herd at Sports Bar and Grill. Get that bang, bang sauce, the boom, boom sauce, and uh, their incredible pizzas. Uh, we're in Gretna. That's just off 370 and Lincoln Road. Patio Show 4.0. Be there 4 to 6. And then come find us. At uh, the single barrel for pregame, Nebraska Rutgers kicks at three. Uh, we'll be settling in there and uh, getting ready to go from noon to two with the pregame, the weekend edition of Hail Var City Radio. Real Red Reaction follows. We'll be at the single barrel talking all things Nebraska Rutgers as uh, the Big Red looks to tack on win number five before the bye week. And 
you know, this is your telling stretch right now. We know November is going to be uh, physical and ugly uh, in all its Big Ten beauty. What I mean by that, I think Nebraska is one of those teams that is going to keep getting better. I don't know where that special team's part is on the equation but the defense settling in you feel like the offense you feel good about under the control of Dylan Riola and the defense has been challenged we'll hear from Tony White uh, next hour we'll check in with Michael Brunts Bruncey with us in uh, oh, we'll say about 15 minutes or so 10 minutes away from Bruncey then Chris Carlett going to join us at 5 30 voice of Rutgers football and National host of ESPN Radio. You hear him on AM 590. Reminder about your friends at Neiman and Sons. Excited to have Neiman and Sons on board with us. Family owned since 1981. And uh, they are specialists when it comes to roofing and siding and gutters. And that customer satisfaction is their priority. Comprehensive services for you, whether it's commercial or residential. Exterior services, that custom exterior lighting, something to think about. When it comes to the holiday season, you need new siding or gutters for your home or business. How about a roof? Uh, They can make it happen. And community involvement, very real with Neiman and Sons. Youth football is their passion. Uh, They've been a part of that for so many years in Lincoln, and it reflects uh, their values of hard work, local involvement, trusted professionals, fully licensed, and uh, a spectacular and spotless reputation, quality service, Customer trust, it's very uh, important to them. And uh, we're talking 40-plus years. Neiman and Sons, call them today. Trevor, Travis, the crew, just phenomenal people, incredible work. 402-423-4853. Log on today, NeimanandSons.com. Scott is in the stream. Uh, Good to have him. You're right, Tiger Shark uh, says uh, no more field goals. I feel that way. If it's makeable, you put Harburg in, not to kick, maybe, hell, try it. That was going to be my question. <laughs> but you, you, put Har- you, you put Harburg in on that short yardage situation and give me a little zone read look. Make him stop two running threats on third and short, fourth and short. But you can't jump off sides. Or put the ball in Dylan Royal's hand and say, go make a play, son. Fine, sure. Whatever needs to happen. We'll get Michael Brunt's prescription. Maybe he is called Mr. Miyagi. Maybe Brunt's has the kicking situation figured out. Hour two on the way with Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Back with you, Tower 2 at Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. Always like and subscribe, Hale Varsity. YouTube can watch the show that way. Find us on Twitter at HVarsity Radio. Give that a follow, the show handle. And uh, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play for the podcast can take us with on your time. Michael Brunts with us from Husker 24-7 Sports. Add Michael Brunts on Twitter to talk some big red. And we're going to get Bruncey's picks with the uh, postseason in Major League Baseball. Bruncey's an A's fan. And uh, Bruncey, fair to say, quasi-Baltimore guy? Uh, or do you just like the hat? Uh, I just like I like the hat the three the three uh, three colored hat I'm a big fan of you know the the Brewers have a nice looking kind of alternate hat that's similar to that as well so um, I can't get on the Baltimore bandwagon now because apparently I was told this week that that's who all the kids like these days so um, <laughs> You have no, wanna, you have no gray on that head of hair of yours. You can't sound you can't sound as old as I do. But that's what the kids like these days. Yeah. But somebody, uh, somebody, I think it was Kevin Suits told me he was like, mm-hmm. you can't be a Baltimore fan because that's what all the kids are doing nowadays. So I I, uh, I I'm not sure which which direction to go. I'm not sure if this makes me a kid or not, but Baltimore might be my bandwagon team for the postseason. I didn't realize you get the, on ki- the bandwagon. I didn't realize the right. kids were into Baltimore. I, I didn't. That's new mm-hmm. to me. 
Yeah, I was I was surprised to hear that, but I then again, I mean, you could tell me the kids are into about anything these days, and I just go along with it. So, <laughs> well, as kids, we were into baseball cards. Did you have the Billy Ripken card? Yeah, I got that one. Everybody's trying. Speaking of cards, everybody's trying to get the Menendez brothers Mark Jackson card now. Is that the, <laughs> is that the case? Uh, you know what we're talking about, right? Elijah saying it's going over his head. Explain. There's a, there's a Mark Jackson card from like the '90s when Mark Jackson was with the Knicks that apparently the Menendez brothers in pre everything row? that happened are in the background of the of the basketball card. Oh yeah! Oh, I just found this. Yeah. The legendary drug kingpins, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. I thought you were talking yeah. about Lyle and Eric. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I mean. The, the, the ones that killed their parents. Yes. Like that. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, okay. I thought we were talking about... The other Menendez. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, I thought we were talking <laughs> to Colombians. <laughs> Jeez. That no. sounds awful. It sounds awful, but there's, a, there's actual Colombian like narcotics kingpins named the Menendez, if I, if I remember correctly. No. No, Lyle and Eric. No, uh. the, the, uh, the American Menendez. They're in the background of a Mark Jackson card. So that look, was so Look good. at your collection. Well, back to business. Yes. How about them bears, Bruncey? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, Nebraska Rutgers. Uh, we're asking concern. Is it Rutgers run or is it Rutgers red zone D? Um, well, I mean, it's going to be, uh, to me, it's a little bit more of the, the, the running piece of it. Um, you know, I think Nebraska handled Maccabee pretty well last week. And I think he's probably a little bit of an underrated runner in the big 10. Um, but you know, the, the, the Rutgers run run game is kind of on another level. I think they're going to, kind of do what some teams have tried to do against Nebraska is kind of shorten the game a little bit, um, keep Nebraska's offense off the field. And I think that's the concern. I mean, I, you know, you look at what Rutgers has done this season and they're kind of the Kings of leaky yards and Nebraska, I think kind of got its footing back under it a little bit with the tackling against Purdue, but they're going to have to, you know, show that they can do that consistently against Rutgers. So it's a, it's a tough matchup because I think a lot of the things that, you know, Rutgers kind of hangs its hat on, which is kind of that punishing run game, a, a defense that kind of makes you earn everything, and really good special teams. That there's some things that that you know cause Nebraska issues, and certainly uh, Calc Manis, the quarterback. I mean, he's he's done well against Nebraska before, so he's not going to be awed by anything in Lincoln. So this is going to be a tough matchup. I mean, I don't think there's any way around that. Michael Brunt's with us, Hale Varsity Radio, at Michael Brunt on Twitter. And uh, Husker 24-7 is where you read him and Schaefer and, of course, Brian Christofferson. We'll get Brunt's playoff picks here in, in a moment for MLB postseason. So our, our friends in the stream, Matthew chiming in, is worried about the, the red zone D, Brunt's, because of the kicking game, the, the field goal and Folks that, that you and I have bumped into from time to time issued a bit of a warning, right? Watch out for Nebraska's kicking game this fall. It was a concern coming in by some folks around the program. It's been a concern so far in Big Ten play, not only from Illinois, but just the hilarity that ensued in West Lafayette. Can it be fixed? They're going to keep working on it. What what's what type of gains? Can it be somewhat trustworthy? Or are you on on my uh, wavelength where you just start going when it's fourth and short? Doesn't matter where you. Yeah, at. I mean, I, I think the you know the field goal line it certainly is is pretty darn close to the goal line at, at this point, just with what they've shown. And it's you know the kicking piece of it, the actual like you know toe meat leather piece of it has not been good. I mean, the concern is, is, you know, you look back at what happened against Purdue and it was even, you know, getting a clean snap and that that's a concern. I mean, it, you know, and if, if guys are doing it well in practice, but it's not translating to the game, I mean, is that a mental thing? I mean, cause obviously it's, it's apparently correct at some point, but it's not translating. So, you know, you just, if you're Nebraska, you just keep working at it. And, and hope that things get better. I mean, I, you know, I'm i kind of eager to hear where Tristan Albano is going to be after the bye week, if that's an option. But, 
I mean, it's just kind of the whole operation right now. And, you know, I, he he came out and was pretty frank after the game about it. Brian Buschini was mm-hmm. as the holder. Um, but, you know, he, he had a hell of a game considering he had two tackles, um, even got – a couple of the snaps down to where a kick could even be attempted. I mean, it was, it was that kind of a thing. So, um, you know, you, you just got to figure out a way to get some confidence in those guys. And, and, you know, if you're, you're calling plays and kind of trying to figure out like, you know, do we go for it? Are we kicking here? I mean, you've got to kind of, I think, approach everything as four down territory until you get well inside the 20 right now, just with what you've seen from that group. We had the question in the stream yesterday, Bruncey, uh, asking if Doug Flutie was available for drop kicking lessons. Is that still legal in college football? I don't I believe so. Is it not? I, I don't believe so. It, it doesn't something – you have to, like, do something very specific in order to be able to do that, right? Wasn't that the thing? Like, you had to, like, fair catch it at some point, and then – like, I, 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 I'm – this is I'm probably Mark Jackson in the heck out of this, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean I I, I think th- I thought there was some weird thing that happened. I, I believe Doug Flutie does not have any eligibility left, I, so um, they might be out of luck there. But Dana Kalen, he handled punts uh, in high school. He had a pretty good pretty good leg. I mean that might be, might be another option there. I'm doing some research here on the old drop kick here. It must be attempted from or behind the line of scrimmage or from the spot of a fair catch. I'm, yeah, I'm confused the more I look into this. I, I do not know, but maybe it's something for the people who make more money than me at the football well, office to look into. Sue's going to be back this weekend. He attempted some extra points in the NFL, Brunts. That's true. That's true. You, got, you have no shortage of options of guys that were emergency kickers at various points mm. in their career. So, yeah, I mean, that that's – but, I mean, that's the thing, though, is it's like it, against Purdue, yeah, you know, he hooked the first one, but the second two, it was like, how do you even get a get a good run at it if the ball's, you know, bouncing and rolling almost to the holder? I mean, that's, that's just a tough way to live. Brunt, so let's talk Nebraska's run game. What uh, What's your uh, prop bet on Emmett Johnson carries and more so time hack me? How soon do you see Emmett this week? I think you see him pretty quick. I mean, you know, I, I think he's shown that he's the kind of back that kind of gives you a little bit of everything that you want. I mean, he runs hard, and we've heard Matt Rule say and, and the offensive coaching staff say, look, we need to find a guy that can make a, an eight-yard run into a 20-yard run or, or a 40-yard run or, you know, the guy that can make somebody miss at the second level. And I think with consistency, that guy has been Emmett Johnson. So the fact that, you know, he, he's one of their better pass blockers, I think he's a pretty good receiver out of the backfield, which, by the way, that, that, that's that been a piece of the offense that's kind of taken off already um, you know, so far this season, the, the running back, uh, the, the passes to the running back. I, I do think that, you know, he fits a little bit more what they want to do. It's just a matter of going to him. So I, I, I do think there's probably a – I think there's a three-headed monster type thing that they can do there, um, but I, I would I would be shocked if you don't see double-digit carries for Emmett Johnson this weekend. I mean, I think he's earned it, and I think he's kind of that the, the best big play threat that Nebraska has in, in turning around and handing it off to the running back. So I, I would I would be expecting to see much more of him. He's earned it. Mm-hmm. Michael Bruns with us here in. Michael, as you look at that Husker offense as a whole, do we know? I think I asked you the same question roughly two weeks ago. Now we're into October. Do we have an idea of what the bread and butter is for this Husker offense yet still? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 don't think, I don't think that there's one thing that, like, you would say this is absolutely what they do. Well, they, do a lot of, they do a lot of things okay, I think. Um, you know, I think the passing game is a little bit of a bigger piece of the offense than, you know, maybe what we expected going into the season. But I think part of that's because you look at where your playmakers are on the offense and you're going to have to throw the ball a little bit to loosen up teams to be able to run it. Um, you know, they've got kind of this Swiss Army knife and, and Ja'Cory Barney that I think they have to use more. Um, you know, I think in, in some ways the – 
the, the, the kind of herky jerkiness of the offense is in some part due to the fact that they have a lot of playmakers at different spots. And I don't know that, that you know, Emma Johnson's a fine running back, and I think they've got good backs, but I don't, I don't know that there's one guy out of those three where you're like, okay, we need, we absolutely need 25 carries of this guy, and that's the recipe that we, we need to win. Like, I, I do think it's going to be a little bit more of a little of this, a little of that, and, and that, you know, kind of adds up to an offensive attack. I think that's the recipe. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that there's necessarily one thing that they can hang their hats on. There are multiple offense, and I, I know that that, uh, that drives fans batty sometimes, that it just kind of feels like you're, you're drawing plays out of the hat a little bit, but it, it seems to, to work at times. They've had enough kind of gash plays to, at least they did against Purdue. They've mm-hmm. drawn enough flags. They, they've got a, enough consistency on offense. I mean, it's not a liability. Uh, when, when, when you're snapping the football, throwing the football, or running the football, it gets down to the kicking part. Have you seen enough from special teams to dial back your win total projection? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I, I think, I think certain parts of special teams have been okay. Like I think they've punted the ball fine. Um, you know, if you actually look at field position and starting field position, Nebraska's actually done really well relative to what they've been in the past. Like, you know, Nebraska, you know, everybody kind of, you know, clutches their pearls about the turnovers, but another hallmark of Nebraska football for the last decade is you basically have been giving up eight to 10 yards in average starting field position in conference play, like with regularity. So I think, you know, the, the, the punt return, even though they haven't broke any big plays, you know, they, they've made good decisions. They've caught balls where before they might've let them bounce. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's okay. Um, it's just, you know, how do you get a few extra points off on possessions? that's going to end up hurting them. I, I haven't dialed back my, my win total, you know, prediction. I think I had them at eight and four mm-hmm. to start the year, but you know, the, the margin of error is so thin for this team that when you, you don't have, you know, a reliable kicking game, you're really kind of on the razor's edge there. So not dialing it back yet, but it's definitely, uh, you're going to have to white knuckle it on offense a little bit more. Brunzi, we're getting to baseball playoff prediction. Royals are threatening, Two on, two out, up one nothing over Baltimore. Uh, three to two Mets, Brewers, Tigers did the good Lord's work and beat the Astros three to one. Uh-huh. And then you got uh, Braves and Padres tonight. Who's moving on? Who are you taking in each series? Uh, okay, each series. I'm going to go. I think Detroit knocks off Houston. Okay. I, I, they're they're riding. They just kind of feel like a team of destiny right now. So I'll I'll get them past Houston, um, and that's partially colored by my hatred of the Astros as well. Um, <laughs> I I would I would pick my Orioles, um, but <laughs> I I feels like Kansas City has got one of those one of those teams that against all odds is also going to get through. So. I think Kansas City finds a way to get past Baltimore. Uh, I'll, I'll take Milwaukee over the Mets and give me San Diego over Atlanta. I, I, I think this is all unfortunately going to end, and we're just heading down the road that's going to end in a Dodgers World Series. But um, that, that's, that's kind of where I see things going. 15 seconds, then. Who do you think plays the Dodgers for, out of the AL? Cleveland. Look I'm going to go, I'm gonna go with the guards. Um, I'll I'll go along with the the kind of sexy pick. I, I see they're kind of the the dark horse. So uh, Dodgers over the Guardians in six. That's my prediction. So you're just going to tease old Shafe again? Okay. Yep. yep. Wow. Michael Brunts, yeah. twenty four Husker twenty four seven at Michael Brunts on Twitter. Bruntsy, we'll see you later, bud. Appreciate you much. Anytime, guys. Thanks. Take care. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. About five minutes away, Chris Carlin, voice of Rutgers football for the last two decades. Going to be with us. Going to try and run him down. You hear him on AM 590 from 11 to 2. Locally, Carlin versus Joe. He has been a part of some amazing radio shows in his career. Let's squeeze in some Tony White while we have time. And uh, Mr. Tony. 
uh, the other Mr. Tony getting ready to take on uh, Jersey's finest and uh, the Rutgers challenge. Uh, cut one. Here is Tony White on the Rutgers Scarlet Knights coming to town. That run game. Yeah, they're they're uh, they're impressive. I mean, the way they uh, the way the backs play. Um, really, really enjoy watching how how blue collar their offensive line is. You know, you can see the the ruggedness in them. How much uh, how much attitude they play with. So it'll be it'll be a great challenge. So uh, that that's an understatement. And uh, when we get to the, the running game part of things, you know, the uh, the, the rushing attack, Manungai uh, cut seven here, some high praise and some real talk from Tony White. He's probably the best one we've seen to date. You know, contact balance, vision. I mean, the guy, he just does not stop stop his feet. And the the really neat thing about him is you see him and he gets cont- – his, his yak yards are, are ridiculous. I mean, he's getting hit at two and three yards. And then and then when they spot the ball, you know, he's gained six and seven. You know what I mean? So that's between falling forward, breaking tackles, the old lineman hitting the pile forward, all that kind of stuff. They really do a, a, a really good job at finishing plays. And – We'll kind of finish up on the Rutgers run piece of this here. Uh, You had Coach White asked about Nebraska and their run defense last Saturday in West Lafayette cut two. Was uh, that what he was looking for from the black shirts? You know, just the guys did what they were supposed to do, you know, and they came with the right attitude. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. uh, We'll see if that attitude shows up again this week. It is. It's an attitude thing. It, it, that's although it's easier said than done, but that is that's what it is about stopping the run. That's what guys uh, in the interior have said for years. That's what former coaches and current coaches say. It's it's a mentality. You're not going to get beat up if you do get beat on a play. You don't get beat on many, and if you do give up one, for the most part, try and corral. I mean, it, it goes into uh, just the attrition part of this, Elijah. You know, if you're Nebraska, this is the first of many, and you don't want the word to get out that Illinois' run run game is is a thing you can do against Nebraska. You responded against Maccabee, but a a bad football team that really didn't have much of a passing threat. I don't know how truly balanced Rutgers is. They haven't had to be. They've been able to run successfully. I mean, they're cranking out. 240 some yards of ball game with a backup back and uh, a, a, a running back and, and with Manung guy that is, you know, one of the tops in the country. So they're going to do what they do. You need to, to stop it. Uh, you have uh, Samuel Brown that's averaging five a carry, Antoine Raymond. I mean, we're looking at the rush, rushing attempts already 97 on the season for Manung guy. Uh, 172 yards, 33 totes. So it's going to be left, right, and up the middle, man, with uh, Manungai uh, on Saturday. And what do you sprinkle in with Kelly McManus at quarterback? He is a seven-touchdown-to-one-interception ratio guy. How threatening is the passing going to be with Rutgers? We welcome in voice of Rutgers football for – uh, since 2004, you hear him with Carlin versus Joe on ESPN National. Chris Carlin with us. Chris, thanks for squeezing us in today on Hale Varsity. How are you? I'm great. How you guys doing? We're good. Excited to see uh, Coach Chiano and Rutgers come to town. You've seen this team, and you've seen these close wins. Is there a feel this season with Rutgers, uh, or do you think there's still some things to prove? I mean, there's plenty to prove, certainly, but it's it's – you know, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they uh, have taken, you know, the kind of the mantra of what they do is around focusing in the moment. And I think the game that really um, showed that the most would be what happened at, at Virginia Tech. They had a they had a twenty three seven lead. They had three trips to the red zone where they came up empty. It was a game that, by all means, they could have one going away and they let Virginia Tech back in the game. They came back and tied it and they were able to get out on the field after that, take the lead and win the game uh, and kind of focus in the moment. And I think, listen, there, that's a game that many times before, you know, might get away from you, not necessarily at Rutgers, but at, at many places 
uh, it happens at Rutgers before too. So I think you have to um, take a lot of solace in that, that, that the moment has not been too big for any of them so far. And that I think, you know, is something that you have to have when you're going in and playing at Memorial Stadium. Chris, is there a, a comp that comes to your mind, NFL or pass backs you've seen with Manungai? Man, it's tough. Um, there's a little Ray Rice in there, uh, just from you know how he runs. But I would say that Kyle is more of a guy that is a little bit more patient, has learned how to do that. But the best trait that he has is that you know. Uh, the fourth quarter numbers have been off the charts for him the last two years. Last year, almost 40% of all of his yards came in the fourth quarter, and there were three or four games where he didn't even play in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that's really what stands out. When, when Not to get too technical in it, but he's a guy who runs very low, and when you get tired and you're trying to tackle that guy, a lot of times you know you're – you're pretty uh, stand up straight high on it, and that's not where you want to be, and that's something that that he's been able to take advantage of. I, it's hard to pinpoint somebody that you would compare him to, but he's just he's small. He's uh, from the, from a height standpoint, but he is tough, and he he just runs very hard. Chris Carlin's with us here talking some Rutgers football, and Chris, it's. Uh incredible what he's done at the running back position, but it's hard to be a great running back without a great offensive line to, to compliment you. What have you seen so far from this Rutgers offensive line this year? What makes them uh, special enough to be the offensive line that can, that can free him up? Yeah, I think it's, there's been a lot of consistency so far. Listen, first and foremost, like anybody, it's been health. You know, they have been healthy, and that is everything. When you are not mixing and matching guys every week trying to find that right combination uh, that might work together. They have had uh, some good luck on that front, uh, whereas in years past they haven't necessarily. I think that's number one. And number two, they have just been uh, a very consistent group. Um, you know, they, they have protected the passer uh, reasonably well. And then there were a couple of times, I think you'd look at uh, what they have done with, with Kyle, that, you know, he has a good feel for where that goes. I had never heard of this before, but uh, one of the offensive linemen, the center, Gus Zelenskis, was telling us last week that um, Kyle actually comes into some of the offensive line meetings when he can because he's trying to pick their brains more on what they're doing. Yeah. And I haven't heard of that very much. Uh, I think that speaks to him, but I think it also speaks to the, the, you know, the, the humus in which they're able to work. Chris, tell me about the Rutgers red zone D. What makes them so special? Obviously, the percentage speaks for itself, but why are they so effective? You know, I I don't know that you can pinpoint it. I think sometimes with red zone, it gets a little bit uh, defensively. It can get a little bit, um, the numbers can get a little bit off. But I I would say uh, a couple of things that just come to mind is, you know, this past week, it was a lot of bend, don't break. That's not by design. They're not trying to be that. Um, but at the same time, with their backs against the wall, they were able to come up with big plays here and there, and I think that's been the biggest thing is just um, for whatever reason they have, you know, the old saying of bowing your necks and all that stuff, that has just kind of resonated pretty well with them so far this year. And listen, when you look at other times, there's been some missed field goals here and there. I think a a lot of times with red zone, uh, especially on the defensive end, um, there's some fortune involved there, too, and I think that's been the case. I think they'd, they'd be the first to tell you that, but they also have really made plays. There was one sequence last week against Washington that the end of the, for end of the or start of the third quarter, Washington went right down the field, but then, you know, they got to stop in four downs inside the five. I think that, that really kind of speaks to the mentality for them, at least. Chris, uh, your impression of Dylan Raiola from what you've seen? Impressive in every way. Um, Just, you know, he's obviously a guy that Nebraska fans have to be very excited about. And uh, I know that there's, there's a lot of work being done trying to figure out how to contain him. I mean, when you walk in the door and you're this effective, that is, that is some heady stuff. And I think that uh, the thing from what I've seen is just 
again, talking about the moment not being too big, it hasn't looked at all like any of the moments have been too big for him so far. Chris, one of the things Rutgers has struggled with this season has been getting after the passer. Only four sacks so far this year for that Rutgers defense. You've watched a lot of Greg Schiano football. It's going to be big to get pressure on the freshman quarterback. How do you think he goes about doing that? You know, it's a good question. I, I think um, they've gotten good pressure. They just haven't exactly uh, finished some off yet. Um, I don't think that they look at it and say, uh, we have to go and do everything we can to get in his face at every moment. Um, he, Greg is a guy who has taken his chances with blitzes before. Um, you know, his defenses have always been ones that have been aggressive. I think this is one that he is selectively aggressive with so far. And they will send guys from every angle at different times. More than anything, it's just about not necessarily being in their face, but having them think about when uh, somebody might be coming. And I'll give an example, like, wasn't a sack, but um, end of the game at Virginia Tech, uh, Tech gets the football back down three, and Robert Longer being the corner uh, kind of comes on a delayed blitz, and he ends up batting the ball in the air and intercepting it to seal the game. I mean, it's it's things like that. They don't – trying to keep them guessing is is everything about where they might be coming from when they are coming. Chris Carlin's with his voice of Rutgers, Rutgers football, and, of course, Carlin versus Joe. Chris, about 30 seconds, we'll get you out. Rutgers wins Saturday if fill in the blank. If they're running the football effectively and, and not shut down, but they can at least limit um, Dylan Rayola, I think the thing that they've done is they've limited points so far. And ultimately that to coaches is the only stat that matters in the very end, how many points they have. They limit them like they did this past week with with uh, Washington. They'll have a chance to win the game. Chris, looking forward to seeing you in Lincoln. Thanks for giving us a few minutes, man. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks very much. Looking forward to being out there. All right. Chris Carlin with us. Good to hear from him. Voice of Rutgers football and uh, spending time with us here on Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Log. We're going to talk big brothers and big sisters. MentorOmaha.org. And that push continues, 60 men in 60 days. October 30th, we welcome in Jake Podoff, part of Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And Jake, it's awesome to have you on Hale Varsity, man. How are you? Doing great. It's a beautiful day here in Omaha, Nebraska. Appreciate you guys having me on. Well, it is awesome to hear your story, your experience, and... Let's uh, start out, Jake, with uh, just big brothers and big sisters. What what got you involved with it? And, and we'll kind of dive into the experience and how long you've been doing it. Yeah. So the involvement process, just telling you guys a little bit earlier, but I have a, a friend at uh, my old work that I used to work with, still friends today, actually. Her name is Natalie. She, she has been a big part of the program for for a couple of years and we just got to chat one day and uh i thought you know after hearing her experience how much she liked it and how much she got out of it i was like wow this is really cool um so i you know always wanted to give back to the community in some way shape or form i thought this was a great opportunity for me because i including my brother and my dad um could always like look up to them ask for advice uh whatever you know whatever road in life i take and I've always kind of wanted to be that person for someone. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to give back. So I thought this was, you know, a great place to start. Uh, so I just went through the application process, super smooth. Uh, again, I think it's awesome how they set you up with uh, a little brother, so to speak, who has a similar personality and similar interests that you do. So that way you can kind of mesh from, from the get go. So uh, shout out to Natalie for getting me into it. If you listen to this someday, appreciate you. Uh, it's been a great experience so far. Jake, you, you talk about the process of getting matched up with your, your little brother and how you have shared interests. What have you guys had the opportunity to bond over? So a couple big things that we have in common uh, is we just both like sports. So uh, from the get go, we started out like playing basketball together. Like a couple of our times just hanging out, have been involved in the basketball court, the YMCA, just shooting hoops and, kind of taking him through new drills. Uh, and 
along with basketball, the Big Brothers Big Sisters program does a great job of uh, they have donors who donate like tickets to the UNO and UNL basketball games and their front row seats, which is really sweet. So they're actually on the floor, uh, which is pretty cool. I've never sat on the floor myself. So selfishly, I want to go, but he, Kyle wants to go more than I do, obviously. So it's, it's an awesome experience. Those are a couple of things that we, uh, we definitely bond over. And I know you guys always sit down and listen to sports talk radio, such as Hale Varsity Radio <laughs> together, right? Yeah. <laughs> every time, every time in the car. When we're together. <laughs> you know, I can just see uh, a little or a teen. Sports talk again, Jake? Man. <laughs> it, it, it's, <laughs> it's Who all, are these guys? Yeah. I kind of like them. What are we doing? What are we doing? Uh, Jake Potoff with us. He is mentoring. He is a big brother. He is a big brother in the Metro. MentorOmaha.org. Big brothers, big sisters, what they do. You've just heard Jake talk about his time with his little, and uh, what we mean is the ability to disconnect, spend time with uh, a, a youth, and uh, just brighten their day and, and vice versa. Uh, Jake, I'm sure you're little. You just talked about floor seats, man. It's, it's, it's give and take. It's a two-way street of uh, just making each other feel good. It's a, it's a great feeling. I think part of it, the biggest fulfillment for me uh, is seeing him have a good time doing like experiences that, you know, he might not normally be able to do. I think that's again, something big brothers, big sisters program helps with a lot is they have, uh, you know, donations from donors, not even the basketball games, but from tons of different things and activities around uh, Omaha where we can, you know, do together. Um, But again, the biggest fulfillment is just, you know, me giving him advice. Mm-hmm. The cool thing is really one of the coolest thing I, I think I've felt being with him is that he might make the, uh, still not official yet, but he might make the Omaha South basketball freshman team oh, this wow. year. Cool. Uh, and we've kind of been working together. I haven't been, I'm not like a good coach by any means. I'm not saying I'm a super good basketball player, but just kind of hearing it from him the last six, seven, eight months that coming to fruition and him seeing like, you know, he gets extreme joy out of it, which, you know, makes me feel good about, you know, the experience as well. It's Jake Potoff with us here talking big brothers and big sisters up in the Omaha Metro. And Jake, one of the things that I think you hear from a lot of people whenever they're looking at an opportunity like this is, well, I'm busy. I have all these things going on in my life, work, family, school, whatever it may be. What would you tell that person that's maybe on the fence and saying, you know what, I'm not sure if I have time for this. What would you tell that person? Yeah, you're a hundred percent right, uh, Elijah. I think you're, you know, people think it's a, it's a big time commitment, um, which, you know, you kind of think about it and you might think that way, but actually we only, you know, you're only expected to hang out with them four hours a month. Uh, so usually what we do is find two days a month to hang out to two hours of the day together, whether that be after work or on a Sunday. Um, but it's not that big a time commitment by any means. And even just hanging out two times a month actually feels a lot more frequent, frequent than it actually sounds. Um, but uh, you're right. It's, it's not a big time commitment as, as much as people think it is. We're talking with Jake Potoff and Big Brothers, Big Sisters, empowering young people through one-on-one mentoring, that quality time that, that Jake's talking about, the, the littles meet and spend time with the bigs, the Big Brothers, the Big Sisters, twice a month and uh, the time is now for you to to get involved with big brothers and big sisters 60 men in 60 days by october 30th uh, you have so many uh, youths that are needing and wanting mentors uh, and get paired up it'll absolutely bring joy and enlightenment to, to your life and you mentioned the process uh, with getting matched jake it sounds like the the match support specialist is 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 pretty on the money. Uh, not only with you and your little, but just other folks that have been part of Big Brothers and Big Sisters uh, that have made lifelong connections. Yep, yep. The match support specialist does a great job. They check in with the little and the big every month to see how things are going. Um, and you know, if there's ever a situation you need to talk to about your sports specialist, they're there for you and. 
Uh, again, I think the organization has ran really, really well uh, from the big brothers, big sisters side of the things. Uh, they're almost like a, a mediator between the two parties. Um, and yeah, I mean, giving back is, you know, a huge part of what I've been trying to do. And I think I'd encourage anyone else out there who you know, has wanted to give back to at least consider the program because again, it's like two days a month and you're really changing someone's life for the better. Uh, at least in, in my opinion, again, log on today, mentor org. be a big brother, uh, or a big sister today, 60 men, 60 days. October 30th is the goal. And uh, get uh, matched up with yeah. a little uh, today and uh, and really uh, be a part of that mentoring, the quality and the quantity uh, that will absolutely be fantastic for uh, a little, little one in the metro area that needs uh, some guidance, some support, and some mentorship. Jake, appreciate what you do. Appreciate what Big Brothers and Big Sisters has been doing for so many outstanding years. And thanks uh, for all your outgoing support in the community with Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Of course. And thanks again, guys, GBR. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you one final time. It's Hale Varsity. We're powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Big thanks to all of you for chime it in red wine 65s made his way in we'll hit a little bit more time tomorrow to dive into some big 10 sec partnership see if that's a real thing big thanks to uh all of you for checking us out on the stream hail varsity youtube hail varsity radio twitter and along the hail varsity radio network uh big thanks to chris carlin uh part of uh carlin versus joe espn national and uh, voice of Rutgers football, his thoughts on Nebraska v. Rutgers a little bit earlier this hour. Michael Brunt's with us. Mitch Sherman joined the show in the middle of a Royals playoff baseball game. We love us some Mitch Sherman. Tomorrow on the program, we'll run down Mike Babcock, Evan Bland with us. How about a BK sighting? Brandon Kenny, of course, former Husker standout, going to be with us at Millard North coaching ball. And uh, does it uh, the right way, man. Such a such a good, good dude with Alliance Sports Training. Reminder to get buckled up. Hands on the wheel. Eyes focus straight ahead. The driver has one job. That's to drive a message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. Uh, podcast us. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. I'm done. Sorry, I thought you were done. I was just going to ask you the question because you, you prefaced – Maybe we'll have some more information about this Big Ten SEC partnership coming up. Let me ask you the question. We, we spent some time a couple weeks ago talking about non-conference scheduling. Mm-hmm. If there is a, let's say, an SEC Big Ten challenge that happens a la basketball, which is kind of be a fun thought. Should there be a partnership? Which, is the, which SEC team are you drafting to be Nebraska's first matchup? Give me Kentucky. Give me a home at home with Kentucky. Or bring the Coach Cal Circus to town. Give me Nebraska, Arkansas. Early 80s, maybe mid 80s even. Either Arkansas was playing in the NCAA tournament when Devaney hosted mid 80s. I think that's right. I was a kid. Or Nebraska just played Arkansas. And it might have been one of the better pre uh, 40 minutes of hell, Arkansas. Might have been. Well, it might have been early, like 82 or 85. I forget which. But give me either Arkansas or Kentucky. Give me Missouri. Nah, you trumpet. Yes, you, you got it. Missouri. Right? Bring back the Missouri-Nebraska Sit bell. down norm. Like, I'll pass on Anthony an, Peeler, know, Doug Smith. I know there's hatred around Texas. Oklahoma we've seen recently. But Missouri with the Missouri-Nebraska bell, I need that back in my life. I know well, Nebraska hopes it would be great, but they, they have a hard time getting Kansas and Missouri to play ball, which was incredible. I mean, that should be a yearly thing. It might be now, but, I mean, I'm not on to basketball quite yet. And all I know is with a, a Big Ten SEC partnership, it would be fun to have one week a year. It's the Big Ten SEC Challenge where all the Big Ten teams play an SEC Bring back team. Missouri. Bring back the Antlers. Just kidding. <laughs> We'll, we'll bring our bodyguard named Markowski down with us. We'll do a show in Columbia. Never been to Columbia in my life. Would like to go. And, and basketball makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I'd check out the other Columbia. 
from a vacation. Kentucky would be good. We got a guy in the SEC office that might get us some good seats. Oh, oh, you're, you're, you're hitting the big red Garth phone, huh? <laughs> we are. <laughs> we need the, we need a phone call to Glissman now. Garth, hey, how are you? By the way. <laughs> Still have any front row seats left? <laughs> Can I sit where you sit, please? All right, back tomorrow. Find us at four. Thanks for tuning in with Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager.